Maimonides teachings, the second to last chapter of the entire Mishnah Torah of his um, epic monumental book that takes all of Jewish law, including everything that ever did happen in the times of the Holy Temple and will happen in the future, including Mashiach. He puts it into halacha, into Jewish law. And this is what we're studying right now. Um, the last two chapters speaking about the future time to come, Mashiach. Now that, and this is in the format of halacha, as opposed to, um, you know, when you study from the prophets, you're going to get um, prophecy of the future, which prophecy of the future not necessarily means it's something that will happen even though we say, well, what do you mean? If it's prophecy, because if it's a negative prophecy, it doesn't have to happen. If it's a positive prophecy, it does have to happen. A prophet that gives a prophetic vision that comes from God, a real true, uh, proper Jewish prophet, saying that such and such negative thing is going to happen, uh, doesn't have to happen. You know why? Anybody? Because yeah. Hashem could wave the decree. But you, if, if people turn around and do the right thing. Ah, exactly. Right, exactly. We could do tshuva. And by doing tshuva, turning around, like Reggie, like you said, so therefore that can annul the decree. And therefore, even though there was a true prophetic vision, and that's why the prophet came to inspire the people, that can change. So the prophecies not necessarily are halakhic, in other words, adjudicated by law, um, and likewise, many different storylines, narratives, are not necessarily Jewish law. But what the Rambam writes here, this is Jewish law. So, for example, you know, in the first class that we just gave, and, and this will be a forerunner for the second class, the, um, <coughs> excuse me, the, the idea that the future holds, that there will be no more war, there'll be no more envy, there'll be no more all of these things, that ultimately is a byproduct of the essence of what Mashiach is. So let's go right into it, okay? In the future, uh, the Mashiach, Melech HaMashiach, a Messianic king, will arise and renew the Davidic dynasty, restoring it to its initial sovereignty. He will build the temple and gather the dispersed of Israel. So in this paragraph encapsulates what the ultimate purpose, what the ultimate idea, concept, and um, function of Mashiach is. What is the concept? What is the idea? The ideal is to return, to renew the Davidic um, the house of David, the dynasty, restoring it to its initial sovereignty, which means it will then give us the capability of bringing to fruition the entire fulfillment of Torah mitzvahs. The entire fulfillment of Torah mitzvahs. In other words, the mainstay of Mashiach is to allow the Jewish people to fulfill Torah mitzvahs in completion, in its fullest sense. We can't do that now. We can't do that now because we can't bring offerings in the altar. We can't, we don't have the Jubilee year. You know, uh, even the sabbatical year that we have now is only based on rabbinic law, but not biblical law. So he's going to re return it to the initial sovereignty. Now, there are two basic things that are necessary in order to have that achieved. And that is he's going to build a temple and gather the dispersed of Israel. Why are those two things important? Well, you, only with the temple. There's so many, uh, so many laws that are of the 613 commandments that are based on the temple. So we can't fulfill those laws if we don't have the temple. Is that clear? Hence, what do you need to have? We need the temple. 
He needs to restore the temple. Any questions so far? What else does he need to do? Oh. Yes. Uh, without trying to bring up a political debate, okay? Is that one of the reasons why many Orthodox Jews don't go to Israel yet? And it's funny that you asked that, Shaul. I just watched a video of, of an Israeli official that came by dollars by the Rebbe just literally uh, an hour and a half ago or two oh. hours ago. And yeah. saying, Rebbe, come to Israel. Come to Israel, he says, uh, for a week, two weeks. You know how much tshuva that we'll, we'll do if you come to Israel. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So the Rebbe says, um, you know, you find out the halachic ruling that if I get to go to Israel, can I come back? And there's, uh, you know, there's uh, several million people here in America that I can't leave them behind. That if I go to Israel, because I may not be able to come back. Halachic, there's a, it's not so simple once you step your, the foot in, your foot in the mouth, whether you can come back. It's not so simple. Well, I don't want to get off topic on that. Maybe another time no, we can learn about that. But it, it's, never, it's not, yeah. Well, after all, it is the Holy Land. And once you're there, it's questionable whether you could leave there. I mean, oh, okay. it, it's, there's a lot of debate about it and what the parameters are of why you could leave and for what you can leave. You can, you know, you can always, there are plenty of opinions that saying you could leave. However, however, there's some opinions that say that once you're there, you can't. And therefore, the Rebbe is very strict. You know, and he, he would go there and he would take this, you know, the strictest opinion saying that you, you can't leave, then uh, you, you can't leave, you know. Anyway, whatever. It's a good question. And um, and, and so that's the, the Nikoda there. Okay. Now, so the temple we need so we can fulfill many of the commandments that we don't have today. And furthermore, the gathering... Of the Herschel here. Thank you for your call. And uh, I want to wish... And, um, and um, another thing that is necessary is the ingathering of the dispersed of Israel. Does anybody know why? Why is that important? From a halachic point of view, not from a spiritual point of view. Remember, we're learning halacha right now. We're learning Jewish law, as the Rambam uh, delineates it. Why, from a halachic perspective, is that important? is because biblical law applies in the land of Israel only when the majority of Jews live in Israel. So you need to have the ingathering of the Jews to Israel in order that you can then have not rabbinic law, but biblical law um, fulfilled. So, for example, today, Shviz, the, uh, this week's Parsha, as a matter of fact, in Bahar, Right, speaks about the sabbatical year. The sabbatical year, they observe it in Israel, but it's only rabbinic. It's not a biblical law today. It'll only be a biblical law, again, once the Jewish people are settled um, in the land and has to be a, a, a majority. I don't, know if it, I don't know if it's 50% plus one, um, but a majority. So those two basic things need to be achieved in order to restore the initial sovereignty. So that's the, the, the actions that Mashiach needs to take, build a temple, bring the uh, dispersed of Israel, and gather them in, in order to renew the house of David, which then will allow us to fulfill Torah and mitzvahs in its completion. And then that's how he continues. Then in his days, the observance of all the statues will return to their previous state. We will offer sacrifices, observe the sabbatical and jubilee years according to the particular particulars as described by the Torah, not described by rabbinic law, but by the Torah law, biblical law. Is that clear? You see that now the 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 um, uh, the, the the progression of the teachings continues. Any questions thus far? Okay. Rambam continues, now anyone who does not believe in him, meaning Mashiach, 
or does not await his coming. Not only doesn't believe in him, but awaiting his coming. Why do you why do you believe in him? What's there to believe in? Why are you believing in him? And why are you awaiting his coming? Because what is he going to bring? He's going to bring the complete observance of Torah and mitzvahs to its completion, right? So that's what his function is. That's what he will do. And that's what we need to wait for. So therefore, denies this person not only the statements of the other prophets, but also of the Torah and Moses, our teacher. In other words, where do we see most about Mashiach? Where do we see? Is ma mainly in the prophets, right? Not so much in the Torah itself. But here he's saying that you don't deny just the other prophets, but you actually deny the Torah and Moshe himself. Now, what does it mean to deny the Torah? Because again, what's Mashiach coming to do? Complete fulfillment of Torah, the Torah that Moshe gave us. So that's the, right. In other words, you know, the laws of people who are deniers of Torah do not belong over here. You know where they belong? In Rambam? Hilchus Tshuva. In the laws of penitence. Because someone who is a denier, a koifer, epikoris, as it's called in, in, in Hebrew, uh, those people, what do they need to do? Tshuva. They need to do penitence. So those laws of such people are there. Ah, so why is there Rambam speaking about this kind of person over here if that person is really should be in the laws of tshuva because that person has to do tshuva? Because that's not his emphasis over here. It's not about the denier he's speaking. The point, I mean, he's speaking about the denier, but in reference, denying Torah, denying the fulfillment of Torah in its fullest sense, because that's what Mashiach is. Mashiach is to return the statutes of law as they were in the previous state, as they were by King David. And it's full and it's and it's complete fulfillment. That's the 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 progression of the idea over here. Not speaking about oh the law of the denier, and therefore he has to do tshuva. The denier of what? Denier of those uh, not only of the prophets in their statement, but those of the Torah. Because this is what the Torah is, and it should come to its greatest fulfillment that Mashiach is going to bring. Is that clear, the progression? Yes? Qu no questions? Wonderful. Torah testified to his coming. So now, what's Rambam doing? He's bringing proof. What proof do we have to this? Right? What proof do we have that the Torah itself is testifying that Mashiach is going to come and fulfill the function that Mashiach needs to fulfill. And what is that function? To bring, I mean, the function will be in two ways, building the Holy Temple and bringing the dispersed back of the Jews to Israel, right? In order that we can then be able to fulfill Torah mitzvahs in its complete manner. So what is the first uh, statement that he brings? God will bring, this is from Deuteronomy, God will bring back your captivity and have mercy upon you. He will again gather you from among the nations, even in your diaspora is at the ends of the heavens. God will gather you from there and bring you to the land. These explicit words of the Torah include the statement, okay, uh, made by all the prophets. What is this? What is this telling us over here? God will bring you back your captivity and have mercy upon you. Mercy upon you. He will again gather you from among the nations. Even if your diaspora is at the ends of the earth, of the heavens, God will gather you therefrom and bring you to the land. So I want to digress for a moment and share with you uh, um, just a profound um, idea of this prophecy. There, think about it. Torah is making the uh, God is making a statement in the Torah, saying that the Jews are going to be dispersed. 
amongst all nations, right? To the, end, the ends of the heavens, let alone the ends of the earth, <laughs> right? And what's God, what's God going to do? It's going to bring you all back. Now, I don't know if you know your history, but I'm sure you're fully aware that any um, tribe, any peoples, any nations, any kind of culture of a people that got dispersed amongst another nation, what happened to them? One of two things. For those history buffs that have been with me, I spoke about it yesterday, conquer or be conquered, right? Either they were conquered and therefore they ended up either assimilating or being annihilated, or they in turn got strong enough from within, they became, you know, the, the fifth column and they got strong enough and built up enough and they conquered back and got back their territory, right? And sometimes we'll go back and forth. You know, Croatia and uh, Serbia, Yugoslavia, you know, da, 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 all, all that kind of stuff, right? Go back and forth. But, event, but, but that only happened if you stayed in your region and you were conquered, then you conquered back. So you maybe kept your culture and you maybe kept your way, correct? But for the most part, probably after some time you assimilated or you just got annihilated, one of the two. And that's every single nation, every single nation. God says here, I'm gonna disperse you amongst all the nations, to heaven even, all the way to, you know, not just one, not, not going to keep you and be conquered by others and, you know, you'll go back and forth maybe. No, 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 no. Spread out everywhere. That has not happened to one single nation. Such a thing, first of all. And that that nation should be able to be gathered back on top of it. That that nation should remit, keep their culture, keep their faith, keep their, their, their way of life. Now it's after 2,000 years and should be able to, to do that and still be called that nation that could be gathered back. Doesn't exist anywhere. That doesn't exist. Only by the Jewish people. And then on top of it, that there will be the ingathering. That's like, that's a prophetic statement that um, can be tested to see if it'll come true. Well, the first part, and even part of the second part, has indeed come true. First part, that we've been dispersed, absolutely. And the ingathering, you know, the Jews are coming back to Israel. Yeah, they're coming back to Israel. Um, and that's definitely something that we see that's happening. Right? Meaning that that's true. Now, that was all a digression from the Rambam. The Rambam isn't speaking about, you know, proving the prophecy of Torah and the uniqueness of the Jewish people and our history and our civilization, right, as, uh, as opposed to all other nations. I, I'm just brought that as a side point that the Rambam is not speaking about at all, just to, uh, I, you know, thought it'd be interesting. <laughs> Before we go back to the rabbi, any questions or any comments, any thoughts on that? Okay. So why is the Rambam saying this over here? Because remember, halachically, what has to happen? Halachically for Torah law to be fulfilled in its completion, that mitz, Torah and Mitzvah should be fulfilled in its, up, uh, in its ultimate manner. The way it's God wants it to be done is only when you have the ingathering of the Jewish people. So that's why he's proving that the Torah is saying that this has to happen. Meaning that there is a time that's going to come that you'll be dispersed. You'll be in exile. But I'm going to bring you back. And that is in times of Mashiach. Is that clear? By the way, 
by the way, just for those who are not familiar, you might say, well, hey, maybe that was only for the second temple. When Ezra brought the uh, brought back the second commonwealth, you know, under Cyrus, they built the uh, second temple, right? The son of, uh, of Esther and uh, after the story of Purim. And uh, you can say, oh, maybe that's what the prophecy is about. Why is that not true? No resurrection of the dead. Well, the, yeah, but the verse isn't talking about resurrection of the dead. Oh, that's um, that's afraid. Not all the Jews. Go ahead, Shaul. Not all the Jews came. Not M only many not of all the Jews. Not only not all the Jews. The majority didn't come. Majority. Yeah, they stayed. The in majority Babylon. of Jews stayed in Babylon. People don't know that. Ezra had a challenge. He had a difficulty of you know inspiring the Jews to uh, come back to Israel. You know, it gets comfortable in uh, exile, right? Right. We get comfortable in, in Dollar. You get comfortable in Ohio. Get comfortable in, uh, you know, Calgary. You know, Boston you can get comfortable in. New York can get comfortable. Not Montreal, though. <laughs> Not Montreal. We, you know, we never got comfortable here, you know, with all the French and stuff, you know, <laughs> and the curfew laws, you know. We, you know, we just never got comfortable. We're always waiting for Mashiach. <laughs> uh, so, um, in any case, so the Rambam is proving that the Torah is saying that there is going to be a time when, yes, there will be coming to the uh, in gathering, which is a, um, which is a a prelude, shall we say? or a prelude or, or, or has to occur in order that we have the, uh, the capability of fulfilling Torah mitzvahs in its fullest. Now he continues the Rambam. Um, reference to Mishiach is also made in the portion of Bilam, who prophesizes about two anointed kings. The first anointed king, David who saved Israel from her oppressors. And the final anointed king who will arise from the descendants and save Israel in the end of days, the passage relates. As I see it by not now, this is from Bilaam. Remember Bilaam, the uh, non-Jewish prophet who wanted to curse the Jewish people. He was hired by Balak, the king of Moab, who was worried and concerned, frightened, very frightened that the Jews were gonna lick up all the nations around them and just wipe them and annihilate them off the map. That wasn't the case. The Israel, the Jewish people weren't going to do that, but they were they were they they were concerned, right? So they hire uh, Bilam to curse the Jews, but it, of course, as we know the story, and then he blesses the Jewish people, and this is part of what his blessings include: a prophecy of future King David and King Mashiach. So in the words, I see it, but not now, this refers to David. I perceive it, but not now, in the future. This refers to Melech Mashiach, King Mashiach. A star shall go forth from Jacob. This refers to David. A staff shall arise in Israel. This refers to the uh, King Mashiach. Crushing all of the Moabite princes. This refers to David, as it relates in Samuel. He smote Moab and measured them uh, with a line, disseminating, uh, decimating rather, all of Seth's descendants, Seth is the son of, uh, of, of Adam. Uh, this refers to the uh, uh, King Mashiach, who, uh, about whom Zechariah the prophecy says, he will rule from sea to sea. Adam will be demolished, as refers to David. Uh, states Adam will uh, became the servants of David. Seir will be destroyed. This refers to Melech Mashiach, King Mashiach, as Uvajah prophecy says, saviors will ascend Mount Zion to judge the mountain of Asav. So um, a couple of questions over here. Um, so we get why we need to refer to um, Mashiach over here, right? Because again, this is the Torah witnessing, bearing testimony 
to the fact that Mashiach will come and he will be the anointed one who will redeem the Jewish people. But why are we making reference to King David over here? You know, this is the laws of Mashiach, not the laws of kings of, of you know, of kings of by, bygone days. Why the reference to King David? If anything, you know, shouldn't the reference be to the first redeemer who's Moshe Rabbeinu, Moses, and the last redeemer who is King Mashiach? Why the reference to King David? Anybody? Any thoughts on that? Is Mashiach is supposed to be from Davidic dynasty? Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, but but what? Absolutely, but why is it necessary? The details over here in Rambam. Remember, what is Rambam? A book of laws. What's the reference over here to King David in in the sense of law? Is, it, is the question clear now? Is the question clear? Yes or no? Give me some thumbs up. It's clear. Clear. Okay. Thank you. So the answer. Hold on. I need a lachai. Give me just one brief moment. Sorry, my apologies. Thank God I went to the water cooler and, and no one was there that I had to have a conversation with. <laughs> ah. Okay. So remember what we said at the very beginning of the Rambam. All right, let's go back up for a moment. The future, uh, the Messianic king, Melech HaMashiach, King Mashiach, will arise and renew the Davidic, Davidic dynasty, restoring it to its initial sovereignty. He will build the temple and gather the dispersed of Israel. So remember, the whole point of Mashiach is what he's coming to do is to finish off what began with King David. So King David is, yes, yes, King David is the father of Mashiach. So that's an important point. But more important than that is King David was the one who uh, um, made it possible because he's the one who chose Jerusalem for the capital of Israel where the Holy Temple would be built. In fact, it was built by his son, but it was built by his son, but we kind of credit it to him. God says you can't build it because you know you shed too much blood, um, but we still call it, you know, the house of David. We still make reference to it. So he's the one who sort of began the process, um, being the king of all the Jewish people. Who is the father or who's going to be the ultimate king of all of the Jewish people? He's the one who began the process of Torah mitzvahs that it could come to its, you know, to its uh, completion, or at least completion in this time period, as opposed to the ultimate completion of Torah mitzvahs that will be in the times of Mashiach. So that there's the tie-in over there. So therefore the prophecy also ties in Right, and Rambam brings it in halacha because halachically there's the tie-in between King David and the Shiach. And furthermore, we'll go through the details. Um, I don't know if we'll be able to go through all the details today. We may have to continue this class. Um, I think we will. Um, yeah. It's a two-part series, it looks like to me. <laughs> um, so, you 
what we will see is further is the four statements that are made here about King David and King Mashiach are later on in the Rambam, and this is the first halacha, but in the fourth halacha, what we will, will see is the parallel in the Rambam's writings about Mashiach and the, uh, the, and the things that he needs, who Mashiach is, what Mashiach needs to do for the Jewish people, and what Mashiach needs to do for the entirety of humanity. And in the entirety of humanity, that will be into two phases, which then will reference uh, to the four things that are said here. I see, I perceive, a star and a staff, that's number two, crushing, disseminating, and then finally, Edom and Seir, those um, four things that are referenced or said by Bilaam in his prophecy, four things about King David and about Mashiach, will be later on, again, in Halacha 4, will be the four things about Mashiach. So we'll see the parallel uh, between them, but not at the moment. We're not going to go there now. So again, the importance of, um, of, of it being part of Jewish law. Any questions before we continue? Any comments, any thoughts? Chaim. We're good. All right. Amazing. Uh, Rabbi Klein, can I just ask a quick question? Sure, please do. Was Mashiach ben Yosef prophesied? Mashiach ben Yosef? Yeah, I mean, why don't we hear as much uh, about him as we do about uh, Mashiach or King David? So in Halacha, there's no bearing about King, about um, Mashiach ben Yosef. There is no uh, halachic bearing on it, and proof being that Maimonides or Ambam doesn't speak about it. So remember what we're doing here, learning Rambam. We're not learning Medrash. We're not learning Agadata from the Talmud like we do Mondays and Tuesdays, right? Which all those things, again, I'm, uh, I don't want to diminish it in any way uh, to make less of it. But it's not part of halacha. Why it's not part of halacha? I mean, the way I understand, and I'm not, you know, the truth is I haven't looked into it uh, specifically, is that it's not clear exactly what it means, Mashiach ben Yosef, right? It's not very clear what that means in a halachic uh, parameters, you know, how you defining that. Here we're giving very clear law about Mashiach. I mean, and we're going to go into more detail on it. We, you know, we just started. We just, you know, finished the first halacha. So we're going to, but we're giving clear, decisive, adjudicated law. I think Mashiach ben Yosef, it's like a lot. And the Rambam in the chapter 12 will discuss about all the prophecies. How do we understand the prophecies? Do we take them literally, not literally? Uh, so on and so forth, right? So... And um, being that, again, this is uh, Jewish law, as opposed to Medrash that might be understood allegorically. Okay? Or, for example, like uh, Mog and Mogog, right? Armageddon, right? The, the battles at the end... So those are prophesies, but, but like Reggie mentioned earlier, not necessarily do they have to happen because uh, we can do tshuva, right? First of all. Secondly, we don't know how that's going to express itself. So it doesn't have a halachic adjudication. So you're not going to be, Ramadan's not going to speak about it halachically. You can speak about it in a major style. But to say in halacha, this is, it can't be. We don't know what that means, a war. 
uh, you know, halacha means obligations. Rambam is teaching us the obligation of what I need to believe in Mashiach. Remember in the second in the second paragraph over here, what Rambam said uh, in the second paragraph, what the Rambam said in this first halacha, right? What did he say? Um, he said, anyone who does not believe in him and does not await his coming, right, denies and, and so on. In other words, the Rambam is giving us the parameters about Mashiach. This is what I got to believe based on halacha, not based on, uh, on, on you know, medrash. Halachically, this is what it is. So when it comes to Gog and Magog, when it comes to prophecies uh, from the prophets, there's so many about the time to come. What does it mean, right? Uh, what does it mean in Mashiach ben Yosef, like you asked? Those are not halachic parameters that the Rambam is giving because, you know, not exactly clear what that means and how that will, uh, uh, you know, come about. Does that answer your question, uh, Davida? Yes, thank you, Rabbi. Thank, thank you for asking. That was very good. And actually, um, I appreciate the, the, the question because it, it gives also more understanding about all the other things about Mashiach that we're not discussing here because they're not part of halacha. So let's continue. And we're going to do the second halacha. Okay, now that we got, what well, what do we do in the first halacha? The first halacha, we created the uh, the parameter of definition of Mashiach, um, uh, the idea of Mashiach, you know, the ultimate goal, and through that, what the function activities that Mashiach needs to engage in, and then the proof. Two proofs we brought. One is about the ingathering, and the one is about Mashiach and how he is the continuation, and, and, and we didn't go through all of the finer details. Again, we will do that uh, at another class um, of the finer details, but we brought two proofs. Now, the second halacha, the Rambam says, similarly with regard to the cities of refuge, Deuteronomy, it states, when God will expand your borders, you must add three more cities. This command was never fulfilled. Surely God did not give this command in vain. There is no proof. There is no need to cite proofs from the works of the prophets for all their books are filled with mention of this matter. So first of all, this is a third proof text from the Torah, five books of Moses, about the coming of Mashiach, right? So the first question is, we had two proofs in the first halacha, why isn't this the third proof in the first halacha? Everything in the Rambam is very exacting. And the fact that he now puts this into a separate halacha, even though it's, it's a proof text for Mashiach, why? Put in the first one. What's different about this proof that, you know, it's, not a, it's a proof again about Mashiach. It's not a proof of something else. As the other two proofs were, why would it be in a separate halacha? So Rebbe explains because this proof is, 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 is adding something. Those are familiar with the city of refuge is someone who inadvertently kills somebody, right? Inadvertently, right? You, uh, you're chopping down a tree and, you know, you uh, picked up the ax and broke off the, uh, the, yeah, from, the, from the wood and it went flying and, and it killed somebody, right? So um, there's no intention, right? No intention. So halach is you need to flee to a city of refuge where you are safe without going into the details there, right? But that's what it is. So the verse says in Deuteronomy, you must add three more cities. And that was never fulfilled. The Jewish people never did that. And Rambam says, can't be that this command never fulfilled would be a command in vain, right? God commanded it. So obviously, where was this command meant to be fulfilled? Times of Mashiach. This command... is showing us from the Torah 
that the Torah was never complete. Who says so? Torah itself. It was never complete. How so? Because this command of the city of refuge, they had six cities, but the three cities that were supposed to be added were are meant to only be added when Mashiach comes. Again, God didn't command this in vain. It's not that the Jews were bad people and didn't listen to God. It's because this is only being meant to be fulfilled in the times of Mashiach, which means that the Torah itself is testifying that mitzvahs were, are incomplete now until the time of Mashiach when this particular mitzvah will be in completion. And as that is there is sort of like the signpost that all mitzvahs will be then fulfilled in their complete manner. Why that, for that reason, that's why this is a separate um, halacha to bring out this proof text because it's adding something essential. The other proofs are just saying that Mashiach has certain actions that he needs to take um, and those actions are, uh, you know, Torah is telling us these are the activity, the actions that um, uh, that Mashiach needs to take in order to, uh, to ultimately bring the times of Mashiach. This proof text is bringing us and saying that the Torah itself is testifying to the fact that the whole point of Mashiach is to bring completion to in the entirety of Torah and mitzvahs. So that's why it's, he's emphasizing it, the Rambam, as a, a separate halacha to bring out the idea again that Torah is, is itself testifying to the fact that the whole point of Mashiach is that Torah and mitzvahs have to be complete because this mitzvah is totally incomplete. This is the first two halachas in Rambam in chapter 11. In America, chapter 11 is bankruptcy. For Jewish people, chapter 11, when you say chapter 11 of the Rambam, we all know it means the final days of Mashiach. We know that, yes, the world will be bankrupt of its ways, because all evil will be eradicated and what will be brought back is the ultimate fulfillment of Torah and mitzvahs to its utmost. We will continue on chapters, I mean, in Halacha 3 and 4 to go into more detail of uh, the laws of, of Mashiach. Um, I don't know if we should do Monday or next Friday. I'll give you a vote. Whoever says Monday, put uh, thumbs up. Whoever says next Friday, thumbs up. So Monday, this is a first Monday. I got three for Monday. Next Friday, I got one, two, three, I think four for next Friday. Okay, so then we're going to do regular Talmud on Monday, Tuesday, and next Friday, we will continue in, uh, in the learning of the Rambam. Okay, but um, since you decided that, there's going to be a test next Friday on what we learned today. <laughs> Rabbi? Yes, my friend. Um, I, know, I know that's scaring you all. Go ahead, show up. I, um, is it possible to do something on the Book of Ruth next week? Um, everything's possible, but I don't know if that's going to be likely because I don't know if I'll okay. be able to uh, have time. I just put you the link okay. uh, in the chat for what I just showed you that we shared. Um, copy it, and that way you could um, look it over, look over the next two Halachas three and four, so you can be prepared for next week. Be prepared with some questions. 
and any insights uh, that we can have for next uh, for next Friday. But uh, do copy and, and and you know paste it so you can uh, so have it yourself. Yes, Rich. The Shabbos. I I don't see it in the uh, in the chat. The Me too. Out. Not in the chat. I don't see I'm sorry. It just uh, appeared now. It just appeared. You know what? I, I put it there. I I copy paste it, but I forgot to enter. <laughs> <laughs> right. On. No, uh, quick question, Rabbi. Why would something so beautiful of uh, Mashiach and David Hamelik? Why why would that be given to someone? The prophecy of to someone who was not Jewish. Why would that be, or am I, am I misreading that, B uh, Balaam? Excellent question. Excellent question. Excellent question. Anybody have an answer for that? Excellent question. So, a answer. Um, you know, um, to, to, uh, adding to your question is like we have so much prophecy from. Bilam about the Jewish people, uh, the ultimate prophecy of Mashiach, but other things too. So even the very, the very first uh, thing that he said, Matova Elecha, Yaakov Mishkan Esech Israel, how goodly are the tents of uh, Jacob uh, and the dwellings of Israel. That's the first prayer we say every single morning in Davening. And we took it from Bilam, the evil person. So uh, what's going on over here? Uh, how, you know, don't stop saying it now just because it's from Bilam. <laughs> <laughs> so how do we understand that? We understand that is, well, firstly, everything that Bilam said, he was a prophet, evil. Evil means he had his own agenda, right? But he could not cross the word of God. He could not not follow what God wanted from him. So he figured he could manipulate God that he'll find a moment that God's going to be angry at the Jewish people and then curse the Jews. Ah, that's what I'll do. I'll find that moment, right? He had his own agenda. A holy person is someone who doesn't have their own agenda, right? And does and only is a mirror reflection of the divine. He wasn't the mirror reflection of the divine. He himself had his own agenda. He was a yesh. He was a mitzias. He had his own ego. He had his own, uh, you know, whims and desires of what he wanted, to, you know, uh, to fulfill in his life. And um, and and they were evil. They were evil. At the same time, he recognized that I can't cross God. I can only listen to the word of God because I have no capability except for that which God gives me. So therefore, I must listen to his word. I'll try to manipulate his word, but I must listen to his word. And that's the idea of klipa. He's in the embodiment of klipa. Klipa recognizes its source of vitality. It comes from God. Right? Klipa recognizes it. But yet, it's a mitzias. It's an entity for itself. It's its own, in, uh, you know, independent being with own independent whims and desires and so on. That's what Klipa is, separated from God, but yet recognizing God and therefore only doing that which is in the fulfillment of what God wants. And that's what he's an embodiment of. So now the whole point of Mashiach is, what's the whole point of Mashiach? It's to take Klipa and to transform it into Kedusha. So oh, that's exactly what we do with Bilam. That's why we say his prayer. We're taking his klipa, his darkness, and we're transforming it into light. Because remember, in the end, he it is the word of God that he is uh, that that he is stating, right? It's not to, you know uh, Stalin, uh, uh, you know. Uh, uh, hating Jews and, and and trying to destroy Judaism, and uh, you know that. No. Yeah, he's he is what he is. But in fact, he is a non-Jewish prophet, meaning he's telling over the word of God. 
He has his own agenda. Like you have many people, clairvoyant people, they have their own agenda. So they know things, they have a sixth sense. That doesn't make them good. Prophecy doesn't make you good. Clairvoyance doesn't make you good. Being a, you know, a, 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 an amazing whatever, it doesn't make you good. It just means you've been given a God, God-given talent. So you got a God-given talent. So in the end, though, being that he can't cross the line of what God um, demands from him, so he needs to just say over the word of God. So that's the whole idea of Mashiach is that we're taking from Klippa, from that negativity and transforming it into light. So therefore, indeed, specifically it comes from him. Because that's the whole idea of Mashiach. It's not like, well, we couldn't find a better place. So, you know, this is where the Rambam had to find his proof. Couldn't find Moshe Rabbeinu. Couldn't find you know, another great prophet that, you know, and use them as a proof. No, the contrary. He is implied in his prophecy is the whole point of Mashiach. To take the klipa, the evil of this world, and to transform it into light. That's what Mashiach is. Good question. Thank you. No, thank you for the answer. That was amazing. Oh, Rabbi, I, I want to ask you something. Yes. Why do you need cities of refuge when Mashiach comes, when there is only good? How do you need three more cities? Beautiful and a wonderful question. We're going to have to wait for that one to be answered. Thank you. I'm out of time right now, but um, uh, I'll try to lead it next week with that question. Beautiful. Till you think you, you think you could remember to next week because I might. Oh, not. I will because because I, I might not. I might not. So I need someone with a good head, not like me. <laughs> <laughs> you have a good head. Don't worry about it. <laughs> Excellent head for Tanya. Okay, for Tanya, but I might forget for everything else. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> All right, folks. All right, amazing stuff. Amazing stuff. Baruch Hashem. Uh, good okay, Shabbos, everyone. Good Shabbos. Good right. Shabbos, Good everybody. Shabbos. This Shabbos is a very, very special Shabbos. We're going to have an amazing Shabbos here at Chabad. And I'm sure wherever you are, you're going to have an amazing Shabbos. Thank you all for joining. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you, Rabbi. Good Shabbos. Bye-bye. Thank you. You too.